Good awesome. morning, everybody. How are we doing? Traction. Yeah? Marginally awake, coffee's <laughs> hitting the system. Um, well, thank you so much for, for hanging out with us for, for 20 minutes. Um, the, you know, Samir and I have known each other for, for quite some time, so this is going to be sort of a fun chat that you're listening in on uh, with two friends. But just quick background on myself, and then I'm going to let Samir introduce himself. Um, I'm a vice president at Bessemer Venture Partners. Bessemer was one of the earliest investors. We were lucky enough to be the earliest investors um, in SendGrid. Uh, I've been with the firm for about five years. We're a $1.6 billion fund, invest anywhere from 50K to 50 million. Um, and I'm going to let Samir introduce himself, and then we'll kick off. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and by the way, you have to mention that awesome uh, X, Launch X. Launch X? I will, I will mention that. OK. Yeah. Um, my name is Samir Delaki. I, I get the privilege of serving as a CEO of SendGrid. I've been there for just about four years now. Uh, it's an extraordinary company that has 75,000 paying customers, went public last year uh, in the fall. It's uh, just a wonderful, uh, a wonderful group of people that are out to um, help drive communications for our customers and help them engage and grow their end users. And that's, that's the mission uh, of the company. Awesome. Well, well I know that our, um, our panel, our fireside chat, is titled Zero to IPO at Breakneck Speed. And I think when a company grows that fast, one of the things that you can forget about um, as a CEO is, is culture. And, and so I think we want to touch on culture for a bit. Um, and I want to talk about one anecdote that I think will tell you a lot about who Samir is and, and, and what SendGrid is about. Um, you know, I met Samir for the first time a few years ago at a cloud conference. Mm. And as most conferences go, we were sort of separated into a bunch of tables to discuss certain topics. And Samir was put on a table where he didn't know many people. And um, it was people all the way from you know, junior analysts to interns at certain startups to Samir, who at the time was about to be a CEO of a public company. And I think what really stood out to me about him, and this was the first time I had met him, um, was just how he made everyone on that table, regardless of their title, feel incredibly important. And I was like, who, who is this guy? He's so full of humility. Mm. Um, and, and I think when I understood more about him and understood more about SendGrid's culture, I was like, aha, that makes so much sense. Um, and so I want to ask Samir, how, how do you sort of articulate a vision for a culture when a startup is growing so fast? Gosh, no, well, uh, thank you for relaying that anecdote. And, uh, you know, I, I would say it's, uh, it's indicative of a, of a deeply held belief by myself and all of SendGrid. We love startups that, uh, and, and appreciate the traction folks always bring this community together because um, building startups is hard and it takes a village uh, and we're just at different stages. SendGrid happens to be on the later end of that stage now as a publicly traded company. But when we got started, you know, it was, uh, we were like everybody else around the table. And um, we have one of our core values at SendGrid. Um, we have four. They're called the four H's, happy, hungry, humble, and honest. And we have a description for what we mean by each of those H's. And, and under the humble H, we say, we can learn from everyone around us, whether customers, partners, uh, colleagues. Um, and internally, that means, and I know as um, as CEO that I can learn from the individual contributor and vice versa. And so I think that's just sort of, it, it is embedded in our DNA um, as a company. I think, you know, culture, uh, as you go through the scaling process and, and you get traction uh, for the name of the conference, there are things that are going to change. And you're going to have potentially, as we did, different leadership teams at different stages. Um, you're going to need different processes at different stages. The one thing that is common across the whole thing, ideally, is your culture. And uh, investing in that very early, uh, I think, is, is, is absolutely critical and I think is often uh, underinvested in and often underlooked when you're, when you're in that scrappy stage, when you're just like, I'm just trying to figure out product market fit, man. I don't know this, this soft, fluffy culture stuff. I just got to make payroll. I got to figure out where our office is going to be, or I got to hire this next person. Uh, I got to get ready for the next board meeting, I, and I get it. Um, my last startup when I was CEO um, in 2007 was a place where I, just, where I got it wrong and I didn't invest enough in culture. I didn't really think about it because I was so worried about all the other day-to-day um, -day hard business stuff. 
And, um, uh, and it's just immensely important, I think, to um, take the time to really focus on it. And when you focus on it, um, make sure that it has edge. I would um, be sure that when you describe the values that underpin your culture, that it doesn't come across as motherhood and apple pie. Right? It can't be that your company is perfect for all employees in the labor market. If that is true, the culture doesn't have enough edge. There is a self-selection process to companies. There is no perfect culture. Um, I love our culture, deeply love it. It would be absolute seventh hell for so many amazing software professionals that I know, and they would hate it. And that's how I know we have a really good and strong culture is because it's distinct. And, and you know, we chatted about this, but you said when you first joined SendGrid, it was equal parts you promoting culture, but also that the culture chose you. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that, that notion of like the, the self-selection, uh, it resonates with you. And so um, when I first joined SendGrid, uh, I, fell, I, I always say to folks, you know, I fell in love with the company with head and heart. Um, business geek, things about the business model that I loved analytically, uh, extraordinary. Um, but what actually pushed me over um, to take the job was that I had fallen in love with these four H's. They deeply resonated with me. Uh, and I arrived at the company, and, um, uh, and, and, and the reason that they resonated, because I felt like I could be my authentic self in that environment with those, those four H's, which all the other people there also believed in. Uh, and, and I remember when I first arrived as the new CEO, um, I got a lot of questions about, well, you know, how are you going to change the culture? Uh, and I said, no, you guys don't understand. I'm joining your culture. The culture of an organization is not um, what the CEO thinks. Uh, in the very early days, it is indeed going to likely get cascaded from the founder and the CEO in the very early days. And that is, that will permeate through the organization because whether we like it or not, whether it's conscious or intentional or not, we hire in our own image. And so, um, so do know that for the founder CEOs in the room here, if you're a super early stage, the way you act, the behaviors you condone implicitly, um, th that is your, your culture is made up of all the behaviors, all the conversations that happen in meeting rooms and in hallways, that really is culture. You know, that, that's how it manifests itself. Uh, and so be very intentional about that. But, um, you know, for me, when I said, you know, I'm joining the culture, the organization ends up with a, uh, a vibe, a way of doing things. And, and uh, no one person um, really can change that. It's very, very difficult to change a culture. Um, and, and so, you know, make sure that the people you're bringing aboard reflect those values that you want to reinforce. And, and for, the, for the more early founders in the room, um, can you give us one or two examples of how you operationalized that culture? I remember we talked a little bit about yeah. what you do um, in your recruitment process that I thought yeah. was really exciting. Yeah, you know, I think um, one of the hard things you talk about culture, it's, it can be amorphous. How do you bring it down to specific tactics um, in addition to like making it edgy and making sure it, it's distinct and unique to you? Um, we think about it across like an employee life cycle. And so we start with recruiting. So what are the ways in which you can embed culture in that life cycle? At the recruiting stage, uh, it's literally having, we have four H's. So on the interview loop for any candidate, each person goes into the room knowing you're covering happy, you're covering humble, you're covering, right? Each person's assigned. And we have templatized questions that we have learned will help actually uh, elicit whether or not somebody's going to be aligned with us. As an example, on the humble H, um, we'll ask, um, please tell us about you know, an accomplishment in your career that you're most proud of. And then we literally just sit there and do a pronoun count. How many times do you hear we versus how many times do you hear I? Uh, it's very telling about whether or not they're likely to be a great fit for. So, so we do that at the very beginning uh, of the employee life cycle and recruiting. It's deeply embedded into whether or not we select. And we certainly turn down tons of incredibly talented people that are not great culture fits. Um, and you have to be religious about that. Uh, next stage, once they're onboarding, um, I do a, um, an hour-long talk with every new employee group. We have an orientation class that's a multi-day event, and I come in and spend an hour at the very end, and about two-thirds of my talk with them is focused on culture um, to make sure that they understand that this is something that we don't just have posted on the walls, like we care about deeply, and I implore them as new gritters 
um, to internalize the 4-H values and realize that it is no one else's job to uh, think about culture and protect culture and reinforce and defend culture, but every single person. That, back to my previous point, culture is something that um, is the summation of every interaction between, in our case, 440 gritters. That's how culture is formed, and that if they think it's the CEO's job or the VP of HR's job or my manager's job, um, the, the culture will, will devolve very quickly. So we, we spent a lot of time in the orientation process. Once they're on board, they'll show up at our, their first quarterly all-employee meeting, and they'll see 4-H awards that are nominated by their peers to people who live and exemplify those values. And they'll see these videos on screens as big as these, these goofy videos of all the people who nominated the person that won talking about why, the per why they nominated the person, why they are so awesome, and what it is about that person being 4-H that makes their job so much better, like why they love coming to work because they get to work with a 4-H person. And when you see those behaviors, all of a sudden it comes off of the posters in the cafeteria and it becomes real and it becomes a living thing. Like we have, um, you'll hear leaders and, the, and therefore over time, it's actually now everyone in the company, you'll hear people turn our H's, um, uh, they'll, they'll put it into the company vernacular. So they'll say, well, gosh, guys, uh, uh, Samir, I got to give you some honest H feedback. You're continuing to ramble again here. Hurry up. <laughs> or, you know, hey, you know, uh, we got to show some hungry H we've got to go get this deliverable met for this customer. And when you hear that in the conference rooms and in the hallways, that's how you know your, your culture is alive and well. But you absolutely you have, to, you have to build it into the daily activities of the company if you expect it to be real. Yeah, no, I love that. And I, and I think one of the things I'll comment on is in, in San Francisco and the broader valley, people think that culture is this fluffy thing that investors don't care about. And if you're growing from zero to 10 million ARR, you'll still get the funding. And, and I would say that's really changed, that now when we discuss who we want to be partners with and we go and visit them in their office, and there is something you feel when you walk into their office and how the employees are behaving, it's definitely something um, that we think about that I think wasn't the case 10 years ago. So I think tech as a whole has, has come a long way. Um, and then one of the things um, I also wanted to ask you, Samir, is uh, also in tech, one of the things we do a bad job of is everything should be done fast. Like yeah. Products should be shipped fast. We should think about culture in a fast way. You should get to IPO in five years. Um, and so because of the title of, of, this, of this panel, um, you know, from zero to IPO at breakneck speed, I wanted to ask you, what are things you wish you had done more slowly yeah. as, as you grew the company before your IPO and even beyond? And what are things, because we are in tech, that you had done slightly faster? Go faster. Um, you know, one of them, uh, when, uh, in particular, as you go through these stages, you may have to, you may hit points in time where uh, you will discover that one of the leaders of the company who had been critically important in helping you get from uh, point A to point B is not going to be able to help you get from point B to point C not because they're not wonderful people, they're not incredibly talented, but you need a different person to help get there. Um, when you make that, when you come to that realization, A, it's brutal and it's rough, but you have to make the call as the CEO and the founder. That's, that's your job and part of the reason you get, um, uh, that's your, your duty. Um, when you make that call, uh, figure out what the entirety of your, that team looks like from here to the next chapter. And in our case, uh, as we did that, one of the things, um, you're going to want to make a bunch of those changes quickly. An organization can actually only absorb so much change um, within a, in a finite period of time. And, uh, and I know that there's a period of time where I said, OK, I've got to go make these changes more quickly. And so as an example, I made two executive leadership changes within the same time period, within a three-month window in a quarter. And it was the dumbest thing I've ever done <laughs> because it is really difficult, both for you as a leader, to be able to do a sufficiently good job of running an executive search for a critically important role in your company. Doing two of those at the same time while you're still trying to do your day job and hopefully also being not a terrible, in my case, you know, husband and father, it, it breaks. You, know, you, you can only do so much. And so I would strongly encourage you, if you're making executive changes, one a quarter, 
is my, would be my <laughs> encouragement. Um, doing more than one a quarter is, is likely to be, both be suboptimal for you and for the organization because they, they won't be able to take it on. Um, the other one is um, going faster, I would say, or going slower would be um, maybe counter, counterintuitive, the board deck. You know, how many people here stress about getting their board deck put together? Um, you know, you try to rush through it. You try to get it all together and get it shipped out as quickly as you can. Um, I've now uh, moved to a model where about two weeks before the board meeting, um, I'll actually go block out half a day. And um, instead, in addition to the board deck, you've got to give them all the, you know, the 100 pages of content or whatever it is, terrific. Um, I write a letter um, to the board. And it tends to be between four to six pages. But it is, um, A, very specific to the, the things that I believe are most strategic, the things that need to be discussed where I could really benefit from the wisdom of the, the board members that we've assembled. Obviously, that's why you have a board. Um, and you get them focused on, the, if we walk away from the board meeting with nothing but progress on these few topics, that will be the big steering benefit from this meeting. Um, and I also find that in writing the letter, um, when you go in long form prose, you can't hide uh, behind, it, it forces a crystallization of thinking that um, bullets on a slide do not. And so I'd encourage folks to think about, take the time to do that exercise. Go, more, go a little bit slower on that, and uh, I think you'll be rewarded. Yeah, and I think one of the things when we chatted about the deck you said was, um, so often CEOs think the board meeting, when you, when you report to your investors, is like a test for you. And in a way, it is a little bit of a test, but you have, you have put these board members on your board to get feedback. And yeah. so often CEOs forget that. They don't ask them, well, what do you think I should do? It just becomes sort of yeah. a reporting thing. Yeah, it's, it's actually the most important function that your board has. If, you know, we talk a lot at SendGrid about a notion of servant leadership, that it's not the usual pyramid of the CEO at the top cascading to the VPs down to the rest of the ICs of the organization, but in fact your CEO and executive team are at the bottom of an inverted pyramid that are supporting the hard work of the people who actually do the uh, hard work of the company and taking care of your customers every day. In that model, the board is underneath that still. And, and you and I often will describe, like, I believe our job is steering. We've got 440 other teammates that are rowing, and they're doing the hard work. The rowing is much harder than steering. But steering is really important, and take that responsibility very seriously and get your board to engage with you in the steering decisions, the things that matter to the business overall. Yeah, no, I, I love that um, metaphor. Um, and, and then, you know, we only have a few minutes left. It's gone by very quickly. Um, so uh, maybe the last question, I get a lot of these questions uh, as an investor because SendGrid has become a very foundational company as you think about APIs as a service and selling APIs as a service. And SendGrid was probably the first company that did that. And then there was Twilio, now Auth0. And a lot of people ask me, well, you guys were involved with SendGrid. How do we appeal to these developers? Like, what is developer evangelism? How do we sell to them? And, you know, I can BS a little bit of that, but <laughs> since we have um, Samir here and, and SendGrid has been so, so critical in, in building up this entire market, I wanted to ask him, like, what advice do you have for the founders? If you want to sell to developers, and specifically SendGrid's story, how can you do it well? Yeah. Uh, a, few, a few tidbits from our team that got this so right in the very early days, I would say one, you know, developers don't love to be sold to. Um, they need to solve problems. They're very analytical, and so you've got to build a phenomenal service and then make sure that the, it's marketing-led so that they are aware of it. Uh, developer evangelism was a huge part of our um, investment early on, and you just have to think of that as a brand marketing investment. Like, you're going to go spend uh, people and time getting out into the hackathons, the accelerators, events like this, where startups live and make sure that they know who you are. Um, and uh, one example of that for us was they would never actually mention that they were from SendGrid. They'd be wearing this blue t-shirt. By the way, these are the same blue t-shirts. We hand out 10,000 of these a year to developers at events and startups uh, around the world uh, every single year. Um, but they are there to help. And it's a give first mentality. And it turns out that if you just show up and are helpful, um, 
they associate that with your brand and will um, will come and take a, take a look at your service. And if you got a good service, uh, everything else, at least our evidence would say, nine years later worked out pretty well. Yeah, and and one last question, really, in six seconds, but. Um, <laughs> uh, when you became a larger company, you know, close to your IPO, even now in the IPO, how did you balance what was so critical about your company, which was the self-serve component, mm. and then you know, Wall Street or, or, or other people asking you, well, when are you going to get to the enterprise? Like, is yeah. that, has that ever been a concern? Do you not care about moving to the enterprise? Like, walk us through sort of how you thought about that. Yeah, yeah it's very intentional, I think, in... in, in um as all the startup founders here know, focus really matters um, until you're ready to take on the next thing. And, and so for us, we just stayed maniacally focused on this self-service go-to-market model. Uh, and we just continued to experiment. And we were waiting for the moment in time in which we believe that all the enterprises that, by the way, should be using SendGrid that are not yet, uh, we, have, we have hundreds of them that have come to us, but there are thousands more that should be using us at much greater scale. Um, and our experience has been when we go knock on that door, it's a very inexpensive and in, uh, it's an expensive and inefficient selling process today. I genuinely believe that will flip um, as cloud adoption, you know, CIOs looking at the set of things they're doing in-house versus um, outsourcing to the cloud, they'll, they'll move those. We're just not there yet, and so we're just timing our investment in when we go after the enterprise to when we believe that segment of the market is ready. And now you're an entire communication platform, so not just right. transactional email anymore. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's all we got. Yeah, fabulous. Thank Thanks, everyone. So Thanks for listening. Hope it's helpful. I need some traction. You need some traction. Let's get some traction.